In today's Cloud Consortium webinar, Claude Baudouin will address the value of communities of interest to the business as well as to the community members and provide examples of successful communities. Claude will also discuss the key processes that need to be put in place, the issues that need to be resolved to ensure success, the paramount importance of a good governance model, and the tools needed to support community activities. Claude Baudouin is a senior consultant with Cutter's Business Technology Strategies Practice and the Data Integration, BI, and Collaboration Practice. He is a proven leader and visionary in IT and knowledge management with extensive experience working in a global environment. Mr. Baudouin has 35 years experience in industry as an author and holds two patents and brings his passion about quality and knowledge sharing to organizations around the world. Welcome, Claude. Thank you, Mark. Um, I'm going to try to show my picture there if... Uh, it doesn't distract people too much. I appreciate the opportunity to present on this topic. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and even good evening uh, to some of you. I see we have a good audience here. I would like to encourage participation, as Mark did, and uh, I welcome your questions. I'm going to try to leave enough time so that we can uh, address your, your questions. I want to be very pragmatic and give you uh, advice based on practicing this and um, and respond to your to your needs. So the title is about creating and governing communities of practice, and you will see that I place a certain emphasis on the governance aspect, uh, and I'll, I'll come back to uh, to what that means um, uh, several several times. So this is going to be about experience based input. I've built and and uh, led communities uh, in a, in a couple of different contexts. Uh, as a consultant, as a practitioner with a corporate employer, uh, as a, a community leader on a public forum. I'm still actually involved in that right now. I want to talk about the value of the communities and their role in the organization, uh, the key processes and the issues that will um, make the difference between succeeding uh, with communities or having them fall flat, which unfortunately they do in some cases, uh, when the right challenges are not addressed properly. And then I will talk about the tools that can be used and the functionalities of those tools that can be used to make communities thrive. But I want to remind everyone, as usual, that the tools are not the priority. You need to um, handle properly the people, that is the cultural issues, as well as the processes behind the communities before you throw technology at the problem. The best technology in the world will not save uh, community architecture that is not based on correct identification of people and processes. That being said, uh, what is um, fundamentally the rationale for building what we call communities of practice and in a, in a couple of slides, I will actually come back to that term and help define or refine why I call them com communities of practice and what are some of the other terms that are used and why communities of practice may be prefer preferable to some of the other terms that you will hear in the industry. Um, some things that needs to be absolutely prevalent in your strategy about communities if you decide to adopt them or if you're already adopting them and are looking for advice on how to make them better is to, to very much include what's here on the top right corner of this slide, which is business relevance, and make sure that the communities are tied to challenges that the organization has, whether it's solving client problems, whether it's prioritizing uh, the R&D budget, whether it's building teams to effectively solve problems, uh, or whether it is the branding and the image making of the organization. These are things that are business needs of the organization, and the communities must not be little ivory towers that exist outside of this connection to the business. This is where communities get their uh, input and their fuel in terms of management support in order to be able to exist and be sustained. This leads then to uh, the formation, the identity, and the actual activities of the community in terms of knowledge sharing. And this comes mostly through networking and the various 
forms that networking can take through which the communities actually perform their work, and that's workshops and compiling information on websites, providing connections between mentors and mentees, publishing papers, etc. cetera. Um, that then uh, becomes the basis for the communities to be able to filter out information that has advisory value to the rest of the organization and, and filtering out of their activities um, documents, white papers, um, strategic advice, etc., that can be massaged and formulated and filtered and distilled, and that then feeds back into the business relevance. And once you've established this virtuous circle um, that's labeled here as community energy, then you have a chance of creating a self-perpetuating motion where the communities thrive because they're supported by the business, they see that their output is valuable, and that output is fed back to the management level and influences the strategy of the company. Uh, ultimately, if people have interesting activities in the community and they do not see how that gets reflected into things that management trusts and follows, uh, the energy will dissipate. Um, I have a couple of slides that are not meant to be an eye chart. If you're reading this on a small screen, you may, you may not be able to re read the detail, but I wanted to point out that I'm not the only one who talks about this. Uh, and in particular, at Cutter Consortium, we have had a certain number of authors who over the last few years have published um, interesting papers on the cultural aspects of the communities and the whole phenomenon. Um, going back as far as 2007, almost four years ago, there was this paper on uh, called The Alien Logic of Enterprise 2.0 by uh, Michelle Bowens, that talked about the cultural challenge of actually um, letting a community format um, be a way for people to work in an organization. So we talked about the, the impact and the cultural challenge of communities in the enterprise. Very relevant paper uh, when you're trying to justify the existence of a community, of a community system side-by-side side with the traditional organization, and we'll come back on, on, on the distinction there, there in a few slides. Another uh, paper that's interesting is this one by Dan Morneau on social media success in continuous improvement, which is more recent. It's just barely over a year old. And I underlined in green uh, uh, some very important sentences in there uh, that justify the existence of community uh, as well as uh, describe some of the challenges. Social software and communities are significant to business because humans are hardwired to cooperate and share opinions and that online communities have an amplifier effect. Uh, they achieve more as a whole than individuals can do themselves. So that is one of the key reasons why communities have value uh, in, in an organization. I made an allusion just a few seconds ago about the distinction there is between a community organization and a traditional organization. And this is the way, um, and the source for this diagram is the work that some of my colleagues and I did at Chamberger years ago. Um, and I will refer to some Chamberger case studies a few times. Um, and I know I have some of my ex-colleagues actually on the phone call, so they'll tell me later if I um, painted this faithfully, but um, w when this effort uh, was started, uh, which is one of my case studies uh, 12 years ago, one of the key things was to distinguish the business dimension and the professional dimension of people's activities. We are all placed in organization charts um, in companies and in even in, in governments uh, in a particular place reporting to specific people and that's the business dimension. It's a traditional form of organization. It is well suited to forming project teams and to working on things that are specific to products and services that our division is charged with bringing to market. Uh, when you look at the longer term needs uh, and the intellectual and professional needs of people, however, um, the business dimension does not necessarily provide the framework for people to thrive 
in terms of their professional dimension, it certainly does not facilitate people who share a certain professional interest coming together in order to solve a problem that crosses the organization chart. So when you are talking about creating uh, communities along this professional uh, dimension, you want these communities to be organic, to govern themselves, to be specific to a discipline, not a branch of the org chart. Uh, you want them to be knowledge-oriented as opposed to project-oriented, and you want them to look at the medium and long-term uh, development and contribution of people as opposed to short-term actions. And that is not something that the traditional organization satisfies. On the other hand, when you introduce a community system in an organization, uh, you are um, enabling uh, this aspect of development. Communities of what? Um, I said that there are different terms. Uh, I've seen companies try to focus on what they call communities of experts. Uh, it's, a, it's a logical attraction. The experts are really obviously where the, the, the key knowledge resides in the organization about a discipline. However, if you only include experts in your communities, you're going you're gonna to miss a few things. You're not necessarily going to have the critical mass of people you need to have a, a, a working energetic community. The knowledge sharing will be limited. There's only that much that an expert can teach another expert. The benefit of knowledge sharing is if you include some less knowledgeable people who will benefit from the interaction with the experts. You would potentially create a system that would seem elitist to the rest of the population. Uh, you would uh, deprive yourself of the benefits of the next great idea that may not come from the experts, but may come from some less expert practitioners who are good thinkers. Uh, and you would have too much work to do between too few people when it comes to, for instance, organizing and publishing knowledge. So at minimum, you want to look at communities of people who practice a certain discipline. And there's really no harm in expanding this to a larger circle of people who are interested in this domain, even if they're not able to contribute themselves, they will benefit from being included in this circle uh, as long as you don't have uh, overriding confidentiality issues that work against that. So I would recommend looking at this diagram explicitly and making a conscious decision of how broad you want your communities to be and not restrict them too much. So other things that a community is not, it's important to uh, look at this because I've encountered, unfortunately, some of these misconceptions in some organizations. Uh, a community is not just the following things, although it includes them. It's not just a mailing list so that people with a common interest can ask each other questions. It needs mailing lists, but it needs to have other activities than just emailing each other. It's not just a directory of people having a certain skill. Yes, career development uh, people in your HR organization uh, need to know that, but that's not the only thing that a community does. And it's not just the class of people who are authorized to look at a certain workspace in SharePoint. Um, they may need a workspace, but again, that's not the only definition. And again, as we saw in the uh, orthogonal dimension diagram earlier, it does not just cor correspond to a branch of the organization chart. So what is a community? Well, here's a, an attempted definition that has a lot of important words that I bolded. Uh, and whether you like it as a definition that you can carry to your own management or not, um, I would recommend that you at least look at these concepts and, uh, and, and give, them, um, give them your attention. The creation of communities is a cultural decision, not a technological decision. It's a cultural decision that lateral, that is peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and knowledge transfer is going to occur. Uh, information is no longer just going to flow up and down the org chart. It's going to flow laterally between peer members of the community. And those communities, that, that, that cultural change is sponsored at the highest level of management. 
the communities are going to be led by senior members, so they're not go going to be led by traditional managers. The, the head of a community is not going to be a VP, but he may be a, a, a scientist or um, maybe just a, an extremely energetic and interested um, person who may not have a doctorate in physics, but is uh, keenly interested in making this community thrive. And it's not managed in a traditional sense by with the usual uh, bureaucratic environment of an organization. And the purpose of the communities is to contribute knowledge to business decisions, again, back to the relevance to the business, while developing and motivating employees. Uh, so it needs to, everyone needs to be able to say what's in it for me and have a good answer. The employees are going to say what's in it for me, it helps me gain more knowledge, develop my career, it gives me better motivation. Senior management is going to say what's in it for me, these communities are now going to present to these companies or this organization, senior management, new ideas, new suggestions that comes from the collective knowledge of the people in that community. Which puts the, uh, this is again a, a diagram that I had uh, done years ago at Schlumberger and that, that I still um, retain because I think it illustrates the, the community-centric view of things. You've got the professionals, that is the community, uh, and professional doesn't necessarily mean technical. It could be professionals of, of accounting or, you know, or of marketing. Uh, in the center of the world, of course, everyone thinks they're the center of the world. And what these people do is they interact and they produce and they consume um, things like uh, white papers, documents, repositories, uh, emails, and web spaces. But they also interact with management, with uh, human resources for a career uh, development, with external groups, with customers potentially, and you need to be careful, of course, that some of the connections here, um, I put a few dotted lines and a few comments because it may not always be easy to decide which channels exist between the professionals inside your organization and people outside, depending on which business domain you're in. You need to make sure that the information that flows is authorized to flow that way, but potentially, these, all these connections exist and are part of the dynamic of, of what exists once a community is formed. So the key to making all this work that, that ties all these uh, concepts together is the governance. That, and governance includes quite a number of things. Uh, and in this slide, I have uh, 10 different aspects of governance. They're, they're not all completely disjoint, but you need to consider them, them all. The purpose and the deliverable of Every single community needs to be well defined as well as the purpose and the deliverables of the, the, the whole community system. Um, you need to brand your community effort. Uh, various, uh, various organizations have used different names and uh, that allows recognition of the community effort um, in, in, in an organization. There needs to be a funding model because some money is needed to support activities like workshops and potentially the acquisition of some software tools to support the communities. Um, there needs to be at least a, a very small team of people that provide the superstructure of the community, the interaction with management, uh, provides reporting on community activities. Um, there needs to be some leadership aspects, um, which include how you uh, create communities, name communities, terminate communities that are not working, decide who can be a member, how many communities can someone be a member of, uh, what, it, what are the responsibilities of a leader. You need to train the leaders, uh, potentially provide also some training to members of a community, probably more lightweight training than you do for leaders just because of their number. Uh, you need to communicate this system and, and do the change management and you need to provide some tools for people to work and train people on using those tools effectively. All these things are part of community governance, and without doing uh, a substantial amount of these things correctly, your communities may not work. Uh, so the one of the key case studies is from Schlumberger, which now is a, co a company with over 100,000 employees. I worked for them for a number of years, um, and I built in particular the IT community within that organization 
which at one point had over 4,000 people uh, just in the community. So it's a, it's a broad-based, uh, uh, very multicultural, multinational company, has received uh, knowledge management awards uh, quite a few years in a row. Uh, st they started very early. They had a first um, internally designed, very uh, ad hoc tool uh, to do email-based bulletin boards back in 1984 when most companies, you know, didn't have email yet. Uh, and then they created a, a community system called Eureka uh, in 1999. The name was uh, imitated from an effort at Xerox. And uh, a couple of years ago, at least last time, I got some statistics. They had 23 communities subdivided into sub-communities, which they call special interest groups. There's about 120 of those um, each community and each special interest group has one or two or three leaders, so there's about 300 leaders total. About 20% of the company's headcount are part of the system. It is voluntary, although it's, it's of course, quite encouraged, but people are not forced to belong there. Um, interestingly, the leaders are elected by the members. They are not designated by management. Um, that was in a, a dictate that was given very early on from the top of the company to make sure that the system would be very different from the traditional org chart driven system. Uh, on the other hand, uh, people cannot enter the technical career ladder, which is a parallel system for promotion for people who are not on a management track, unless they're a member of this community system. So uh, there is a clear message, again, if you want to be recognized as a technical leader in the company, you have to participate in uh, the community system. And they have homegrown tools for historical reasons, even though uh, if, of course, they did this effort now, or if they had done it in the, uh, um, the middle of the last decade as opposed to the end of the previous one, they would probably have found commercial tools to support them, but at the time there was nothing, so they, they were all their own. Um, the original Eureka at Xerox, which I mentioned as being the origin of the name that Schomberger used, um, was basically something that came out of a study they did uh, in, in the uh, mid-1990s. And uh, John Seeley Brown, who was, I think, the CTO of Xerox, uh, wrote a book about knowledge management in 1999 in which he told this story. They were trying to find out uh, how people um, who serviced copiers exchanged lessons learned about how to best fix certain problems. And they thought that people would write notes and memos and, you know, descriptions of procedures, etc. And they found that that was not at all how the knowledge flowed about how to best repair some problems on copiers. Uh, the knowledge flowed around the coffee machine. Basically, technicians back from a job would go to the water cooler or the coffee machine and would sip a cup of coffee with their friends and they would tell war stories from bul bulky copiers in the field and that's how the knowledge was disseminated. So basically what Xerox did, they said, well, if that's what people do, let's just offer them a better environment and better tools to basically make their life a virtual coffee machine environment so that they have, they, they spend time sharing those lessons learned more often than just when they need another jolt of Java. And that's how the Xerox system was born. Um, there are a bunch of other case studies uh, that are available and, or as I say, Googleable now because that's, that's how most people can find them. Uh, so you can actually uh, Google the, the, the stories about everything that's on this slide and the next slide. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details, but what I want to point out is that you find on there uh, large companies. Um, you find IT companies like IBM, pharmaceutical, uh, insurance, consulting. Um, I would, um, and, and you find names of um, systems. You find, for instance, that Deloitte called their community system D Street. Um, and um, some people use, you know, funny names like that. Some people use uh, uh, more pedestrian names. I mean, National Instruments School, there's the NI Developer Network, okay. 
that may not be uh, tremendously creative, but it says what it does. Uh, so, so there's different ways people have attacked it. Uh, in some cases, it's uh, very focused on a tool. In some cases, it's really focused on identifying uh, the people. In, in many cases, it's really um, a clear will to break the barriers between country-specific organizations. That was the case at Deloitte, for instance. There was an excellent report last year from Deloitte, Australia, and clearly they were they felt very isolated down there, and they used communities to break the barriers with the other uh, parts of the organization. Um, you have, uh, you know, a, a veterinarian a chain of clinics. You have um, government and military entities, uh, the Air Force and the U.S. Army, the Federal Credit Union is another consulting company. You then have some stories that um, basically I gathered, um, and my friends at Schlumberger will know about those, uh, and, and um, it's interesting to see in some cases how some companies focused on communities like Chevron, who uh, coincidentally had the same number of communities that Schlumberger had, uh, has different names for things, um, and then supports them using SharePoint wikis. Uh, on the other hand, uh, three years ago, and that may have changed. I don't. I could have anonymized the names here. That might have been uh, a good political precaution. I didn't um, to show that that Shell was complaining three years ago that their web space was a mess. Uh, they had a lot of different knowledge sharing capabilities, but they were not organized by communities. There was not a clear focus, and I cannot help. Uh, but think that the lack of focus of communities might have something to do with the fact that there was a proliferation of uh, websites that was not really um, that well coordinated. Uh, NASA is an interesting case. Of course, we all know about the fact that they've had a lot of canceled projects, uh, Constellation and the shuttle, and so there is a constant knowledge drain that happens in those cases, and uh, they don't have a central knowledge management organization and again, they were uh, they, they have a certain set of communities, but they have trouble retaining a focus due to the organizational turmoil through which they go. Um, conversely, you find a company like Fluor with 44 communities, uh, everything extremely well organized, discussion forums, a good notion of what knowledge objects are, a rigorous deployment well integrated, uh, another good case of, of someone who took that bull by the horns and, and achieved a lot of value uh, from it. So let's move on to what are the activities of a community, and then that will lead us uh, progressively to the tools you need to use to support that and to the conclusion. Um, so communities can do whatever they want, and you need to leave community leaders free to decide what's good for their community, a community of chemists, and a community of uh, insurance adjusters may not like to do exactly the same things the same way. Uh, some people are better at writing. Some people are better at discussing things. Uh, webinars are a typical activity that you can do within an enterprise in a community. Face-to-face -face workshops are not so easy if the community is widely dispersed and if there's not much travel money, but... Um, they have extra value because people like to talk to each other face to face. Collecting and distributing news, including news from the outside that the community helps filter, can be a good activity. Authoring white papers, whether they're for internal publication or for external publications to journals, um, is a, a difficult activity for people to go through, but it can be quite motivating because it provides, you know, their names on the front page of a of, of a pamphlet or a memo, and then assembling a resource catalog, uh, bibliographies, etc., for the members of the community, especially for the more junior members of the community to learn from that library of information. This is just a sample of some of the activities, and each community should brainstorm for itself what are the things that it can most benefit from. As a result, um, there, are a certain number, uh, there is a certain number of useful functions that community tools can provide. And here's eight things that you can find in a community environment from an IT standpoint. 
websites and ability for people to, to register and leave and find information about communities. Uh, there can be a social aspect to communities with profiles and photos and connections between people um, that is not always present in, in communities. In the Schomberger example, for instance, uh, they have a profile system tied to the community, but there's not a way for people to establish basically a social network, but other people do that. And, and I remember that it was discussed multiple times, actually. You need, obviously, discussion boards, some form of forum that allows people to discuss issues. Uh, there may be surveys and polls. Uh, presence tools may be provided as part of your uh, organization infrastructure anyway, but when you look at who are your fellow members in the community, you should be able to determine where someone is and whether you can talk to them. And then uh, tools should provide some metrics, at least to the leaders of the community, so that they understand how healthy their community is, how much activity is going on. Uh, which leads to what are the tools that provide all this. Here's a set of tools. Uh, the purpose of this presentation is not to help you choose a tool, but suffice it to know that there is uh, at least uh, these nine or ten uh, vendors, and there's probably more, and you can go to comparesocialsoftware.com to find uh, more of the latest news about which community tools are the best. And obviously, you're going to have a bunch of selection criteria, including all the traditional IT criteria like pricing, development option, etc. Uh, but what you ne really need to look at, uh, re going back to the previous slide, is which of the functions that a community need do these tools offer. Um, and you don't, you need to to tell the vendors what you need, not let the vendors tell you that. Something is not needed because they don't offer it or vice versa, which is their favorite game. Regardless what tools you use, uh, it's very important to help your members understand what they can do with those tools. If you think of the life of a community member, the life of a community leader, a triggering event happens. Someone has, has a question to ask. Someone wants to share some information. A community needs to start an initiative, perhaps because management has said, could you please produce a white paper uh, to explain to us uh, what uh, is the market for this new type of mortgage or whatever. Uh, and then you need to navigate a certain maze that, that leads you to decide whether the actions you undertake as a result of that triggering event is to, to send an email, to populate a blog, to start a wiki, to write a white paper, etc. How do you decide what to do in the face of that triggering event? You have a certain set of tools that give you some capabilities. And um, what, what the leaders should really focus on uh, after the tools are introduced is to teach the community members how to make good use of these tools and to use a small number of features well rather than use everything. You know, I'm, I'm taking a a jab here at the usual Microsoft Office stuff. You have PowerPoint, you use 10 features, there's 300 in the tool, and uh, basically they just make the menus more complicated. So don't let the community tools become your, your PowerPoint or your Word with too many options you don't use. Just, just use carefully and more intensively the ones that really respond to your, to your needs. Um, in that same vein, you need to train the community leaders. They have a key role in leading communities. There are some aspects of community leadership that are not obvious. You cannot expect anyone to just come into this role and know how to, to do that. It's not the same as managing a project. There's a lot of aspects that are related to motivating people and trying to make people do things even though you are not their superior. So how do you convince someone who's already very busy to spend some more time doing something for the community? Some of the aspects of community leader training uh, are about the psychology of, of that aspect, how to make people do things. So um, uh, I've given in the past some uh, community leader workshops, um, and, and I know other people, you know, there's Richard McDermott, who's a well-known consultant uh, in this domain, has the whole offering in that respect, um, where you, 
basically bring a dozen leaders in a room for a day, and you say, okay, at the end of this um, of this day, you may not be a perfect leader, but at least you'll understand some of the stumbling blocks you might you might run into. And what we tell them is, uh, here's the role of a community. Here's the leadership skills you need to practice. Uh, you need to understand uh, for yourself as well as for people you work with, whether they're action-oriented, process-oriented, idea-oriented, or people-oriented, and try to get a good complement of all four facets when you do something. Uh, you need to understand how to interact with management, how to convey the value, how to organize activities, and how to reward people. And um, when when we do this, my colleagues and I, we do it extremely interactively. It's really a very energetic, a very interactive session uh, where people sort of learn by doing in the course of the day. Uh, and that should be done, of course, as soon as possible after a community leader takes his function, which means that if your organization has uh, 20 communities and maybe a total of 50 leaders, and uh, half of them change every year, you've got 25 people to retrain every January, and therefore there should be a constant program of retraining leaders year after year. It's not a one-time effort. So my last slide, um, and I'm glad I was able to leave a lot of time for questions, is a, a list of references. So uh, when you uh, get the slides, you can, you can see here what some of the key um, reading materials are. If you have more time to read, some of these uh, papers were selected for you because they provide, I think, a lot of complementary information. And with that, I'm going to turn this over uh, back over to Mark to drive the Q&A period. Well, thank you very much, Claude. And as um, Claude said, we'd like to now move to the Q&A section. Um, you'll see to the left of the screen a questions for Claude Pod. If you'd like to ask a question, just type your question into the bar and type the speech balloon next to it, and your question will come up. Um, Chloe, we have a few questions that are along the same line, so I think I'm going to um, ask that one first. And it's really how do you measure success or effectiveness um, and or ROI of communities? Oh, the RI question is a, is a good one because uh, there are so many intangibles in this. Um, I, you know, I worked a lot of, I worked in corporate IT for many years and, and I, I hated this word. And I'll, I'll just tell you an anecdote I, I used to tell, I still tell today. If you present a new idea to management and they ask you what the ROI is, uh, I've seen many people leave that meeting later and said, they want to kill the project. And I said, why, why do you think they want to kill this project? Because they asked for the ROI. Uh, so the idea was uh, if, uh, if you manage to get people convinced of the value of what you're doing, um, they're actually not necessarily going to, 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 to ask for it. But let's uh, seriously, I mean, I, I understand that this is a, a, a legitimate question. Uh, one of the ways to look at that is to ask people um, how often do you waste time because you cannot identify the right person to talk to inside of the organization about a problem you have? Um, and you try to get, and the calculation becomes a little bit fuzzy and whether the number is going to be trusted by a, uh, a, a manager who's trying to avoid spending money is another question. But if you look at, if someone can tell you how often that happens and how much time they waste or um, examples they've had of choosing a solution that was not optimal on that cost them some time or some money because they hadn't um, been discussing the issue with the right uh, interlocutors, then you may be able to attach a certain amount um, to the uh, value of or you may be able to dollarize the benefit um, of actually having a good system where when you're faced with a question or a need, you're going to be able to identify the right members of the community, discuss it with them quickly, and benefit from the collective wisdom of that community instead of being left to your own, to your own devices. Um, how do you measure? Um, well, so the, the typical things you measure in communities are uh, what do they produce? 
and what is the feedback that um, the recipients of that production give. So if you give a webinar, who attends it, um, what can they say at the end of the webinar about what they're going to do differently as a result of what they've learned there? And again, can they estimate uh, how much this saved them? And um, what people do at the end of webinars, by the way, they, they typically, well, half of them don't do any measurement, and, and half of the other people ask the attendees whether they thought the webinar was good, were the sessions uh, too high, too low level, too long, too short, etc. What people forget to do is to go back to the webinar attendees or to a physical workshop attendees three months later or six months later and say, can you tell us that in the last three to six months since you attended this, you did anything differently because you attended this session, which was organized by the communities? Um, if you do that and after a certain while people cannot tell you that it had any influence on what they did, You'd be justified in saying we wasted our time and money, and you have to, at that point, um, reassess why uh, there's not that much more evidence of concrete results. So that's, that's one thing you can do. Obviously, going to management and saying, did you see any benefits from the communities? How many white papers have you received that were written by community members? What have you done with them? Um, and same thing, if no one can give any uh, evidence of success, there's two, two possible reasons. Either the community effort is not working well, or management paid lip service to the creation of the communities, but didn't really put in the effort to actually use the results of these communities, and that may be something that needs to be, to be reassessed. But hard numbers are really hard to, to come by, but where you can start is by following with people who are members and leaders and stakeholders in communities over a period of time. It's not an instant measurement. It's something you need to do uh, repeatedly over a certain period of time. Okay, great. The next question has um, to do with that as well as I think. It's, what are some best practices? Um, for example, are there better incentive models than others to ensure participation in the community? Uh, it's, it's a very culturally dependent thing in companies. If you take a company that has a habit of giving monetary rewards, for instance, when someone writes a paper, they get $500. When they file a patent, they get $1,000, etc. and it's a well-established practice in the company, um, you're going to have to do that too, potentially. You may have, uh, you may want to have um, the leaders of the community vote for, you know, the, the members who's contributed the most during the year and give them a similar award. Uh, other companies absolutely hate the idea of sort of quote-unquote bribing people for their work and prefer different types of awards. People are usually quite sensitive to other forms of recognition. Uh, being mentioned in the, uh, you know, the, the vice president's uh, end-of-the-year report as having contributed uh, to to their work, uh, having their names in a in a hall of fame thing about the best white paper of the year, um, being simply mentioned in uh, in reports. Uh, at Chamberger, they had a, a website where you, a community leader could actually post on the could actually select members from the community and sort of put their names in a particular box on the side of the of the website, um, there was a box for the latest joiners in the community, but the community leader could also decide who to showcase, and they could do that for sort of whatever reason they wanted, including the fact that someone had made a significant contribution. So these are some of the some of the ways you you, you can do that. Okay, our next question. Ultimately, what is the community of practice accountable for? It's accountable for providing relevant knowledge to both its members and to senior managers for whom that knowledge is going to influence strategic decisions. So it's accountable for producing something tangible that is a piece of knowledge that can either influence strategy 
or increase the knowledge of the members of the community. So that, that's how we measure. Now, a, a piece of knowledge may be, okay, we held a webinar, and, and uh, if that webinar, if there's, or, or a seminar, and if there's influence that this resulted in providing important information to people who didn't have it before, um, that's something that, that means that this accountability was, um, was achieved or was met. Um, so it's up to a community sponsor. I didn't mention that role really, but each community should have a sponsor in management somewhere, someone who, who can basically provide that accountability tie-in so that they can go to the leader of the community during the year and say, what have you done for me lately? Uh, or say specifically, you know, one of our biggest challenges in the company this year is how to grow our uh, Asia-Pacific market. Um, do you have someone in the sales, or do you have people in the sales community who could help us, or in the marketing community rather probably, who can help us determine how to address that market? Could you write a white paper for us? At that point, if the sponsor says, please do that for me, and the leader consults with the members and says, yes, we'd like to take on that challenge and we'll deliver it it will deliver something to you in three months. Now you've created accountability and you can track this. Okay, great. Our next question, what do you recommend to reinvigorate a community of practice that has lost momentum? Um, first, you need to, uh, to, to understand if the leadership in place is the right leadership um, and, um, and, and it, sort of assess why uh, it lost energy. If there's a leadership issue, um, then maybe someone who in management who is interested in, in this community producing something should uh, go and, um, I lost the screen suddenly, but I, I trust them. I'm, I'm still there. I think I timed out. I'm going to log back in. Uh, don't worry about that as long as you can, can keep hearing me. We're okay. Yep. Um, so in that case, you know, there, there's there, there's there's a question of um, is the um, is the le does the leader of the community uh, know that there is this issue and is he or she willing to fix this? Um, secondly, it could be that I mean you. you all communities are not destined to live forever. Um, so you, you might actually um, decide that this community flagging in its activity is simply a sign that it's outlived its usefulness. And uh, there, there is such a thing as deciding that, uh, that you can disband. Uh, that has, that we, we see that happening. Um, reviving a community at all costs is not necessarily uh, the proper um, the proper thing to do. Um, it could be that you need to change the activities it does. You can re-energize a community by giving it a new challenge and maybe deciding to use a new way to address this challenge that has been tried before. Maybe you try to make people write papers and they just all hate to write. So in that case, what you do, maybe you do uh, some webinars, maybe you ask people to record little video clips and post them on a website explaining what their, um, their interest is, and you just socialize this until it creates a small network of people who are willing to be more energetic. Okay, great. Along those same lines, um, what are some of the anti-patterns to avoid? Conversely, what are some of the patterns that tell you the community building is proceeding in the right direction? And that one anti-pattern, I, I recognize that there's an architect in the room when I hear the word anti-pattern. Um, an anti-pattern is um, building communities that mimic too closely the organization chart. Um, I once was confronted with a, a, a consulting division that had uh, was divided by vertical markets, so there was one part of them which was fi finance consulting, and they wanted to create a finance consulting community. Well, didn't make any sense um, 
um, and, and I could gloat and say I was vindicated in the end. It didn't work, but but there were other reasons anyway. Um, it didn't make sense because actually all their finance consultants basically knew each other already, so they didn't need a new mechanism to talk to each other. What, what would have been important was that actually there were some people consulting in the finance domain that shared interests in the finance discipline with people who were not consultants. They were doing finance internally. They were in the CFO's office somewhere, or they might have been actually you know, division controllers in Brazil or whatever, and they had some common knowledge with the finance consultants and they should have shared it. That's how they should have defined the community. So an anti-pattern is to make this, um, is to make this mimic the org chart. Another anti-pattern is when the community leader is basically designated from the top down by a senior manager as opposed to being someone who's sort of like, uh, comes out of the community as uh, you know, a leader who emerges out of his own energy and, and willingness out of the, out of the community. Uh, a good pattern is when when it goes viral. Uh, you you set up the community. You you did a significant publicity effort at the beginning to try to find uh, the first uh, 50 or 100 members in the community and make them enroll. But after you do that, you find that the number of people in the community keeps growing by itself. Um, that's a good pattern. Uh, and and that, that indicates that enough people are finding enough value in it that they mention it to their coworkers, again, at the coffee machine, and that then people go back to their office, go to the website, and enroll in the community. That's a sign of success. Okay, I think we have time for one more question. And we've had a number of questions that um, discuss this, um, so I'm going to try to combine them into one. And what is a reasonable amount of time um, and funding to start a community of practice? Um, leaders are going to have to spend probably anywhere between 5 and 20% of their time uh, doing stuff related to the community. Whether it's 5 or 20 percent completely depends on the company, completely depends on the challenges, etc. I can't give you a real rule. Members should not have a net loss of time. They should actually have a net gain of time because um, they're going to replace some of the unsuccessful searching they do or unsuccessful knowledge manipulation they may be doing today with more successful knowledge access thanks to having the contacts in the community. Um, then at the, at the level of the management of the community system, um, you obviously are going to have probably for a company of any significant size a full-time communities manager who, you know, organizes the effort, organizes the web tools, um, helps train the leaders, etc. Whether you need one or two or three people and how much of a budget you need in that organization is going to depend on the on, on the size of the company. But you can create a community system with one person with a pretty small budget uh, for tools, uh, especially if you already have a collaboration infrastructure like a good content management system and maybe some collaboration tools inside of the, the company, like Bolton boards and chat rooms and stuff like that, then you're not going to need to spend a lot of money to equip yourself. You're just going to create a sandbox for the communities within that system. Um, but uh, if you're a company of, uh, you know, several thousand people or more, uh, you clearly are going to have a full-time person managing the entire thing. Um, and, and reporting to some management in uh, whatever makes sense in the organization. It could be to HR, it could be to marketing. It, uh, preferably, don't, don't make that an IT thing. If you make it an IT thing, it immediately colors it in a, in a weird way for, for the rest of management. I would recommend against that. If there's a CTO, a chief technology officer, in a company that's highly technically oriented, Putting the knowledge manager or communities manager under the CTO makes a lot of sense, for instance. Okay, well, thank you very much, Claude. On behalf of everyone at Cutter, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. 
If you have further questions or comments, we encourage you to email or call Claude at cbaudoin at cutter.com. Also, please make sure to visit cutter.com to check out our events section where you can register for upcoming um, webinars and other events. We'll be sending you an email message with the URL where the on-demand recorded version of today's webinar is available. Thanks again for coming to the webinar today, and this concludes today's webinar. So to end this, please just hang up your phone. Thanks. Bye.